Hey, welcome to another episode of Specialty Crops Corner with Brad Burgerford. Brad Burgerford is a horticulture specialist and with the extension at Ohio State University South Centers in Piketon, Ohio. Brad has extensive background in growing different kinds of vegetables and specialty crops. And Brad, it's always a, a great pleasure talking with you. Yeah, it's been great being on the program this uh, this spring, Patrick, and we've covered a lot of uh, real good topics in the specialty crops arena, and I'm going to be covering a, a new one today that we started at South Centers in 2013 on hop growing in Ohio. It continues to be a popular crop, uh, especially with our growing craft brewing industry, and it, it has been. Our craft brewing industry uh, experienced a major spike in the U.S., uh, back in uh, around 2010, 2011. So that's why we initiated this uh, hop research at the South Centers of Piketon to try to capture some of that income that our farmers could possibly uh, be producing for the growing craft brewing industry. So let, let's talk a little bit about, you know, introduction to hop growing in Ohio. Good enough. I got a few slides here. Uh, for those of you who have never seen a hop yard, they, uh, they grow up on top of these big, tall telephone poles. Uh, they are a very quick growing crop. Um, grow about a foot a day this time of the year. This is when they're really putting on a lot of vegetative growth. And unlike a lot of our uh, pumpkins, tomatoes, sweet corn that are annual specialty crops, hops are perennial. So once you plant them, um, you're going to have, a, if you keep them healthy and keep the disease out, you will have a hop yard. Uh, in Germany, there's 100-year-old hop yards. So um, that's probably the biggest difference that you'll see across the countryside. Um, those that have started producing hops for the commercial brewing industry are these big, tall telephone poles. And you wonder, why is there telephone poles out in the middle of the fields? And that is why, because they do grow almost 20 foot tall, um, 18 to 22 foot tall, and they do are supported by that aircraft cable. So you see at the top of those uh, telephone poles here on this picture, uh, that's a heavy gauge aircraft cable that's uh, strung between the poles to help grow our crop on. Uh, if you haven't ever seen a hop plant, this is what it looks like. Uh, the, the cones, the little round things you see growing up that plant are what they make the beer out of. So those are called the hop cones. And hop cones are produced on a female plant. Uh, here these days, unlike 100 years ago, all of our hop plants in the hop yard are female plants. Um, our brewers and our consumers do not like to have seeds in their beer. And when you have the male plants growing in the same yard as the female plants, they cross pollinate and we'll get seed formation. So today, our producers produce an all-female crop, and if there are any males, uh, you can d distinguish a male plant pretty easily from a female plant. Those male plants are rogued out pretty fast. You know, when it's pollinated, I, I'm used to having bees or some kind of insects pollinate the flowers. Is that the same with hops? Uh, the bees will dance around the bloom somewhat, but they're not required. They're, they're more... Um, wind pollinated. So just because they're 20 feet in the air and the wind's blowing them, they move enough to uh, go ahead and pollinate that crop. Um, so yeah, we do not need pollinators uh, just because we're not cross-pollinating between two two plants, so we don't really need any. And we do in encourage beneficial insects because there are a lot of bad bugs. So beneficial and they get on hops, so beneficial insects are the good bugs. So we can encourage like lady beetles and lace wings uh, in our hop yards that will help control those bad bugs. Um, so we do utilize an insects in our, in our hop yards, but not so much for pollination purposes. Um, like I mentioned earlier, the uh, hop plant is a perennial plant. Its main productive life uh, is 15, 18 years, 20 years. But like I mentioned, there are 100-year-old hop yards in Germany. So as long as you keep that perennial plant growing, just like any perennial in the landscape, uh, it'll continue to uh, grow vigorous and healthy throughout, the, throughout a long life. Um, as you saw in the picture, we do plant them in rows. Now, those rows are pretty wide spaced because as you're going up 20 foot, you get a lot of shading. There's a lot of competition. Um, so our 
our hop rows will be much wider than you see uh, from our traditional corn and soybean rows that you see in the fields growing down the road. Um, those are usually 30 inch rows where our hop rows will be anywhere uh, 15, 18 feet between rows. We actually encourage wide row spacing because there are some fungal pathogens that, that uh, will infect uh, infest our hops and by having a wider row spacing we get more air movement within that plant canopy so we can keep that plant drier which will help reduce that uh, that disease inoculum from from uh, taking off in our hop yard. Um, one thing we did not know when we planted our first hop yard at Piketon in 2014 uh, was how much water that these hop plants take over our traditional corn, soybean, tomato, sweet corn crops uh, because they're 22 foot tall. So if you take that biomass, that large of a plant, it's going to uh, take up a lot more water and require a lot more water than the, uh, than the traditional low growing crops just because there's so much more leaf area there. I did talk about fertigation in past programs a few weeks ago, I think, Patrick. And uh, fertigation is where we just inject the fertilizer uh, into the water, into the drip, uh, drip irrigation system. So fertigation, like we talked about a few weeks ago, is very important with hop production because like this, this time of the year, they are growing that foot, a, a foot a day. And so for a crop to grow that much, it really needs a lot of nitrogen, which helps support that growth of that uh, of that new vegetative growth if we didn't provide the crop the nitrogen it needs at this time of the year the crop would be stunted and our yields could be cut in half or more so that's why drip irrigation fertigation is almost a requirement when we grow hops so that's a little different than some of our other uh, traditional grain crops um i already mentioned there's a lot of diseases that get in there and a lot of bad bugs so you got to be just walking the hop yard looking at your plants um, looking for disease spores, looking for insect outbreaks, and try to catch them early. And what's really tough, because they're 20 foot in the air, you also have to be checking 20 foot in the air. So we uh, at the South Centers in our hop yard, Tom Harker, who is our, uh, who is our research assistant and manages our hop yard, as those plants continue to grow and get taller, he will actually has a telescoping, uh, telescoping uh, pruners that he will put way up 20 foot on and collect leaf samples 20 foot in the air, bring those samples back down, then inspect those for disease or insects. So that's another different thing um, compared to some of our other specialty crops because we're having them uh, scout for those diseases 22 foot in the up in the air. What, what are some of the typical diseases or typical insects? Well, in terms of diseases, we're learning something new every year. <laughs> we get new diseases, and actually just one has been diagnosed in Ohio this morning. I got the confirmation. So we have another disease that we're dealing with. But the most common ones, uh, the most common fungal pathogen is downy mildew. Back in the 19, uh, 1920s when this crop uh, um, well, we quit growing it because of uh, prohibition, but another reason why uh, growers quit producing hops was because of downy mildew. Downy mildew is a very bad fungal pathogen, and it will uh, outright kill the plant. It will not only land on the leaves and kill the leaves, but it goes systemic through the vascular system and kills the plant that way. So that's the bad uh, disease that most of our hop growers are very concerned about on the outlook for. But um, a few of new ones that just, it seems like we get a new one every year. Uh, the one this morning was Fusarium crown rot. Because of the heavy rains we've had this season and last season, we're starting to see a spike in Fusarium crown rot. Um, another one, hop stunt viroid. I've had two hop farmers have to kill off their entire yards, let them lay fallow for two years, and then replant because of this viroid. Viruses transfer by vectors or insects. Viroids travel by the wind. So that's the trouble we have when we get a viroid outbreak. And then a couple of years ago in Ohio, we, uh, we diagnosed our first, got our first confirmation of powdery mildew. So as you can see, Patrick, there are a lot of insect and, and uh, disease pests that we need to keep on the lookout for. A couple of the insects, uh, um, European corn borer is a bad pest on corn. So we have a lot of corn growing in Ohio. So guess what? 
the European corn borer now has made its way to the hop. So there are several, and we'll talk about more in depth uh, the disease and insect uh, management uh, as, we, as we go into future programs here. But a typical life of the hop plant, it breaks dormancy in March. And then we'll start harvesting down south here. We'll harvest uh, uh, towards the end of August, um, end of July, depending on variety, end of July down around the Athens area. Some of my growers uh, start early harvest, but usually in August and into September is when hops are typically harvested. How do we sell them? Uh, like the picture I've shown of the hop cone, we sell them as fresh whole cones, or that makes a good wet hop beer or a green beer. Uh, dried cones, where we actually take that green cone and dry it down. That is for dry hopping and making dry hop beers. And then some of my producers have pelletized the hops, just like you have pellets for the wood pellet stove, or you have pellets for dog food or rabbit food. Um, those pellets are made, uh, the cones are crushed and smashed into a pellet form, which is the most common form that the brewers used in Ohio. And most of our hops, because of that growing crab brewing industry, uh, are sold directly to the breweries. Um, so yeah, a little bit of background. We had not commercially produced hops in Ohio since about the 1900s, since Prohibition. And with the growing craft brewing industry is where me and another researcher, uh, Dr. Mary Gardner from our entomology department at OSU, uh, got the idea in 2013 to pursue bringing back, back this old crop to Ohio. So we did, we received some uh, uh, funding from the USDA, which was greatly appreciated, as well as support from our uh, OSU administration. And so we started planning and doing educational programming on hops. Uh, today we have close to 200 farmers uh, growing hops in the state of Ohio and they're being produced pretty well throughout the state. But um, we continue to learn new production systems new pr and fine tune our production systems. But our initial research at least set a standard uh, production system where growers could adopt this crop. But now we're fine tuning that system to get better quality hops and get better yields out of them. Uh, but basically there's an opportunity because of that growing crap brewing industry. Uh, um, it just, I, I don't, I'm not really sure what sparked that, but it just was a thing that the, the crap brewing industry really started gaining momentum back in uh, early 2000s and two, in the 2010. Plus there's a demand for the hops, uh, different varieties, just like our produce buyers want to buy and sell locally grown produce. The brewers want to sell beer that's made out of local ingredients. So they are willing to pay a little premium price to buy from a local farmer so they can sell that to the consumer that they're using locally grown hops. Uh, there's several breweries in Ohio doing a 10 mile beer, a 15 mile beer, and that means they source all the ingredients from within a 10 to 15 mile radius of their brewery um, from local farmers. So if you want to see, uh, you can go to the Department of Commerce, uh, Ohio Department of Commerce, Division of Liquor Control, and you can see how this craft brewing industry has grown. And these are just some numbers from that website. You know, we thought we had a lot of, uh, we thought we had a lot of breweries. We're looking at 100, uh, 130 or so. And today now, uh, or as of 2019, we're at 619 breweries in the state. And so the, the market has only went up for our, for our hop producers. But like I said, in the 1920s, hops basically were stopped growing throughout the Midwest and in Ohio. Uh, prohibition kicked in, which <laughs> reduced our market because there was no beer to be, to be sold and made. So the hop farmers just had no market. And we have not commercially produced hops in Ohio since, the, since prohibition occurred. Um, so this is just some rough estimates of what the market potential is out there and roughly Ohio breweries produce about, and I, these are probably older numbers, uh, but 1.4 million barrels of beer. So that's estimated we need 2,100,000 pounds if the brewers are using 1.5 pounds per barrel of beer which is not a hoppy IPA, which has a low amount of hops in it. But that alone, uh, 2 million pounds is worth 21 million bucks. And right now, most of that is uh, purchased from the Pacific Northwest. They have been in hops production since the 1920s because when Prohibition hit the United States, 
the, the growers in the Pacific Northwest in Washington and Oregon um, were shipping to international markets as well as the national U.S. markets. So they remained in business because they still had their international markets and were able to ship from the ports there. So when, when, when Prohibition hit, they kept growing at reduced acreage, but they kept growing. And then when Prohibition was dropped, those growers uh, just increased acres again. They have been the, main, been the major producers ever since. When you grow hops, can it be used for anything else or is it just primarily in making beer? It's mainly for making beer. Uh, one of my farmers, uh, his wife makes, uh, makes crafts out of hops. So she makes a pillow that has hops within the pillow. So really, uh, when you smell these hops, they smell so good. And when you put them in your pillow, you sleep very well and you don't have to drink a beer uh, to, to sleep well. So they are being used for other uses, but no, the predominant 99% of hops um, are, are being produced just for beer making. So really, and you look at these estimates and going on our yields that we've averaged at our South Centers, our OSU plots, and my farmer's yields, you know, we need about 6,000 acres. And right now, like I said, we, we only got about 200 acres. We've come a long way since 2013, 14, uh, but we still have much, much opportunity for growth uh, in hops production in Ohio. So this, this will be a lifetime of trying to get our acreage up to meet the demand that we have. Um, but it's not for everybody. Hops are a, uh, a very hand labor, stoop labor, high investment crop, unlike a lot of our corn and soybean crops where it's all mechanized and we do it from a tractor seat, hops are not. Uh, everything we do on hops is all hand work. So that's why it's not for everybody. If you're not one that wants to work hard outside, do a lot of stoop labor or have the labor to help you get these timely tasks done in a timely manner, um, that may not, hops may not be for you. If you don't have Basically, we say $20,000 an acre to invest up front to buy the telephone poles, buy the plants, buy the aircraft cable, and then wait three years until you get a crop because hops require a maturity, about three years to reach full um, harvestable maturity, then hops production may not be for you. Um, plus, you have to sell your crop uh, you have to be out selling it. You don't just can't just load up a semi and drive to the local elevator, <coughs> grain elevator, drop it off and sell and get a check. It don't work that way. You have to build your markets. So if you're not one that wants to hit the road selling hops and build your markets, uh, maybe hops are not for you. Um, but what are the benefits to Ohio breweries? You know, like I said, they want to buy local hops for they can sell their local beer and advertise it as such. Plus the decrease in transportation costs. Some of these hops, they're paying as much in transportation costs or shipping costs to get it from, uh, from the Pacific Northwest as the hops themselves. So if they can just have the local farmer deliver them, it's going to be a lot, uh, a lot more economically feasible for that brewery. Plus just that transparency in the supply chain. That's why a lot of our local Produce buyers like to buy local produce from local farmers. The brewers are the same way. They want to be able to show that whole farm to glass scenario. All the ingredients are being grown locally um, to connect their brewing to agriculture. A lot of people forget of all, majority, all the ingredients in beer, except for water. Uh, all the ingredients come from farms, and so they want to keep that connection to agriculture. Um, this is a picture of Mommy Bay Brewing Company up in Toledo. They actually have their own hop yard right downtown Toledo. Uh, this is their hop yard right next to their brewery in an old vacant lot that a building was uh, knocked down and um, taken down years ago. So here is one, and they're been, they've been partners with us for, for many, many years, but they are growing their own hops right next door so their consumers can actually see a hop yard. Now, this is a very small hop yard, so they still buy a lot of local hops from local producers, but they are actually growing their own to be used in their, uh, in their beer. When you take the hops off the plant, what's the life of that, the cone? As a fresh cone without being dried and without being refrigerated out not even not even an hour because they heat up just like produce would now if you can put them in a cooler 
they'll get about 24 to 48 hours out of them. But if you can dry those down and pelletize them and store them in a uh, nitrogen infused mylar pack like potato chips, uh, we have some hops that are still in great shape, you know, going on three, four years that have been in the freezer. So as long as you keep them froze, uh, they'll slowly lose quality, uh, but they, 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 can, they can remain good viable hops for a long time. Um, but yeah, again, we're getting to the end of the show here, Patrick. So I'll just go through real quick. Uh, hops are basically that hop cone that's produced on the female plant. And I don't know if you're a big beer drinker, Patrick, but <clears throat> if you are or those connoisseurs of beer, um, hops are what provide the flowery, citrusy, fruity, herbal taste to a beer. That's what makes your beer. Malting barley does some of that, but for the most part, hops are what really set that beers taste apart um, different varieties of hops and how many hops you use in that. And like I said, it is a perennial plant, so it'll be around for a long time. Um, and then there's hundreds of varieties. We got tests going on at about 40 right now at Piketon, but there's hundreds of varieties uh, to choose from um, that the brewers are wanting. So we're always looking for that new hop variety. If you want to see how hops are produced, we did take a photo gallery of our yard going in at Piketon. Um, starting from the time the semi-truck pulled into the barnyard with the telephone poles on it through our first harvest. So you can go to our website uh, at this address and see a whole year of starting a hop farm. But we'll talk about this more in future programs, uh, Patrick, but just like with all farming, you have to have your moisture in check. You can't have your soil erode. You got to have good soil nutrition, uh, lots of sunlight. We talked about pest control already. Got to get that trellis set up. You need that labor to harvest and do your task on a timely manner. And then you'll need some, if you choose to dry your hops, if you have a market for such, then you have to dry, pelletize, and process those hops according to uh, Ohio Department of Agriculture food safety guidelines. Um, just to give you an idea, you know, we plant these things. Uh, um, our poles are about 34 and a half feet apart in the, throughout the hop yard. Uh, we use different types of string to, uh, to twine those plants up. So we'll talk about that in future programs. And just lots of sunshine. So we don't want to plant them close to a barn or a house or a silo or a bunch of tall trees because sunshine makes hops and makes money. So our take-home message uh, for today anyway is we can grow hops in Ohio. A lot of people ask that. We can grow them anywhere in Ohio. Um, you grow the hops for either if you're a brewer, what your beer tastes is, or for your brewer you're selling to what beers they're producing. So you've got to select the variety that you want or your brewery wants well in advance. Quality is crucial. Pre-plan in advance. So there's a lot of stuff we'll talk about on planning your hop yard in future programs. And just, again, like I started the program off, don't underestimate the management that's required. So in the meantime, you can subscribe to our hops email list at this address, or you can go to our Facebook, South Centers Ohio Hops, or you can go to our website and find some of our uh, previous research results. And we'll uh, definitely talk about more on hops production in future programs. Uh, you said that it takes three years from the time that you start the production to the time you actually get a cone. Is that correct? until you get a full mature crop. Yeah, that plant will make little baby crops for those three years, but nothing to of any volume. So we don't tell our growers to plan for any real volume of harvest until year three. So, so during that first year, um, re really you have another six months or six weeks or you know, checking with some of the microbrewers uh, about the kind of varieties that they would need. Correct. And plus, during those three years, you can be taking samples with those baby hops and start to whet the brewer's appetites that, hey, we're going to have a full crop coming on here. And that's usually the selling point is that baby crop that you use as a month. Huh. Prior programs, you had indicated that an acre of uh, vegetables require about 27,500 gallons of water. Is that comparable to what hops would need on a hop crop that the irrigation engineers will tell us to time that 27,000 times at least three because really? of, because of that higher 
taller crop, the evapotranspiration is much higher, and there's so much more crop there. So when you're planning your irrigation, you know, worst case scenario, you'd want to plan for three times that in terms of volume of water needed. Now, we, we had a very wet uh, spring. Well, well, in southern Ohio, we always seem to have a very wet uh, spring. Does that affect the, the growing capabilities of the plants? Uh, yeah, if you look at this picture of our yard at Pike, and we have ours on a tall raised bed, just because you want to drain off excess moisture. But that new disease I was telling you about, the Fusarium crown rot, will spark and, and accelerate in a yard that does not have good drainage on a wet year like we have. So we do encourage raised beds, and we will talk about making raised beds for hops in, our, in future programs. Brad, as usual, I always learn a great deal uh, from you about the different products and services. We're, we're talking with uh, Brad Burgerford. Brad Burgerford is a horticulture specialist with the uh, Ohio State University Cell Centers and Extension Agent. Um, Brad can be uh, uh, willing to answer any of your questions or email him. Uh, he is uh, a connoisseur and an expert on many of the different plants uh, that we rely upon when we go to uh, different grocery stores. Brad, thank you very much for uh, all the useful information. I look forward to our next program. Yep, me too, Patrick. Thank you.